like to welcome you to our PropTech panel to discuss the next frontier. Before the panel discussion begins, please allow me to introduce our moderator, Zach Ahrens, the co-founder of Metaprop. Zach Ahrens is a real estate investor and a real estate developer who has been working at the intersection of real estate and venture capital for more than a decade. Zach has funded more than 60 startups in this space as an individual and well over 60 startups through Metaprop's venture capital funds. In addition to early stage investing, Zach has worked on large scale mixed use development projects and has experience with real estate development, commercial asset management, property marketing, and commercial leasing. Zach has been featured in dozens of international publications and media, including CNBC, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Business Insider, Forbes, and others. Outside of work, Zach is an assistant adjunct professor at the Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, and is the co-author of the book PropTech 101, which if you stay till the end of today's summit, you will get a signed copy of the book. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Zach Ahrens and our other panelists. Thank you so much, Heidi, for the, the book plug and the intro. Um, is everybody fired up? Ready to go? So we have a really, really fun afternoon ahead of us. We get to talk about innovation and technology with some of the most esteemed people uh, in this space. Our panelists are so esteemed, so august. I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a moment. But before I do that, I want to just set the table for what we're going to talk about and separate out a little bit technology from innovation. We're going to talk mainly about innovation, how people in the real estate industry and in government can look at new and innovative business models for bolstering both NOI and double bottom line initiatives, uh, including making housing more affordable and other things like that. We're also gonna talk about adoption of technology, software, hardware, technology-enabled solutions. So without further ado, we have uh, incredible uh, panelists today. We have Lucy Fletcher from Quadrio Group, Marcella Sapone from Hello Alfred, Shane Adore from Sidewalk Labs, and Angie Marks from the University of Chicago. They are going to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about what they do, and then we'll get into the nitty-gritty of the Q&A. So Angie, you wanna start? Sure, uh, thanks Zach. My name is Angie Marks. Um, for the past 20 years, I've worked in development in Chicago, community development, real estate, uh, neighborhood development, primarily on the south side of Chicago. Um, I've worked in nonprofit, private, and public sector roles. Um, I joined the University of Chicago about a year ago, and a big portion of my work is our off-campus portfolio and building on the decade-long initiative of the university and our partners to develop a vibrant uh, commercial corridor and innovation ecosystem around 53rd Street and Hyde Park. And a lot of my comments today will really be very hyper-local around those efforts uh, around innovation and ecosystem in Hyde Park. Hi, everybody. I am Shana Doerr. I'm from Sidewalk Labs. Uh, Sidewalk Labs is an alphabet company, so we're a sister company to Google, which is kind of funny to say because we have 130 people, and so no, I don't work out of the Google building. Um, we have our own startup type of office um, out in New York, although I do live in Chicago. Sidewalk Labs was started about four years ago, right before Alphabet became Alphabet, and it was really born out of a passion of Larry Page to really think about how cities can be more efficient and how technology can disrupt cities and the fact that technology had not yet disrupted cities. Uh, he recruited Dan Doktroff, our CEO, who's the former deputy mayor of New York and former CEO of Bloomberg LP, to come lead Sidewalk Labs. Um, I started right around the same time, and since then we have launched a few urban businesses, um, an urban healthcare startup, a, an urban uh, uh, transportation replicability strategy, um, as well as we've spent most of the last two years developing a master innovation and development plan up in Toronto. Uh, and this plan is for a large site on the waterfront. It's actually quite amazing, um, on the waterfront of a very beautiful and growing city. Uh, and the thing that we think is interesting about it is that we have integrated technology into a typical and traditional master plan, as well as a whole bunch of other systems that you might not traditionally think about as you're thinking about master 
master planning. Um, so I'll talk a lot about that or weave that in throughout our comments today, but I do come from the perspective of thinking about things holistically from a systems level and the hypothesis that if we don't think about things more on a district, city, neighborhood, community level, we're not going to truly realize the benefits that technology and innovation can have on our urban environments. Hello, I'm Marcella Sapone. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hello Alfred, which is a real estate technology company focused on residential in urban environments. We are operating in 20 different cities in the US and serve a half a million households. Uh, we are thinking, designing, and executing against the future of how people are gonna live. So imagine living in a multifamily building in a city that takes care of you. It gives you back your time. It has a zero waste footprint. Uh, you know your neighbors. And it is run more efficiently on a smaller cost basis than buildings today. That's what we do. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Lucy Fletcher. I am a portfolio manager with Quadrille Property Group. Uh, we are the, uh, we're, well, Quadrille is an investment management developer and operator. Uh, we manage the real estate assets and mortgage portfolio for British Columbia Investment Management based in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, BCI's portfolio, uh, the parent fund's portfolio is about 150 billion Canadian dollars. Uh, our real estate portfolio today is, uh, including mortgages, is about $38 billion. Uh, my portfolio covers uh, everything outside of Canada. So in Canada, we're a vertically integrated real estate operating company. So we own, manage, lease, develop everything that we do. So you know, in the discussion today, I can talk to, to some of uh, that and how we're innovating uh, within our existing portfolio and outside of Canada, where my primary focus is. Uh, we partner with um, operators, developers, um, and also we're investors in technology. Thank you, everybody. All right, so we're going to go around the horn uh, with some questions, uh, and then we're going to do a round of really short questions, which is called the lightning round, which for those of you who've never experienced the lightning round, take the most fun you've ever had, multiply it by five, <laughs> that's what you get. Then we're going to open it up to the audience for audience Q&A. So we will start with uh, Lucy and then go around the horn on this one. What aspects of technology uh, are making your job as a real estate professional easier to do, uh, faster to do? And what aspects of your job are surprisingly not yet disrupted by technology and still quite analog? So when you, 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 you asked the question, I, I kind of took a step back and thought, what's changed in the 20 years that I've been in the profession? And, um, and it was really interesting this morning with Steve's, um, Steve's presentation, uh, where he was kind of looking back to, to where we are today and what's changed even in the last seven years. So um, I think the year before I started in the industry, Google um, was, uh, was kind of founded. Um, and so, you know, I think the discussion this morning was does that sort of, I look at it really in two ways, conventional IT, uh, which is really kind of the day-to-day, -day, the bedrock of what we do in our office environment uh, as, uh, as, as investment managers. And then also really the operational and the differentiated IT, which is really in our building. So when I look at conventional IT, I think a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same, which doesn't really answer your question, I know. But um, so yes, on the day-to-day -day email, all those traditional um, technology tools that are out there uh, haven't really evolved that much in my mind. I think appraisal is one area that really hasn't changed, and Steve talked about that as others did on the, the subsequent panel this morning, and I think that's something that clearly is an opportunity for, for disruption. Um, you know, when I look at um, the physical real, real estate environment or the built environment in which we, we develop and own, I think a lot has changed. Um, the actual infrastructure, the physical built buildings themselves, you know, they exist in the same form that they have for years. I think we'll talk later a little bit about some of the changes that we're seeing. Um, but I think, you know, we've talked about, we've heard about this morning, tenant mobile apps, smart building playbooks, uh, CRM rent pricing tools. Um, but, you know, I think we're looking to technology and innovation really to improve productivity. And certainly, um, you know, as an organization, we focus on being smart ready. I don't know that we have really, you know, defined or we're continuing to define how that that works for us, um, but clearly, you know, I think that that continuum is changing on such a ra at such a rapid pace that we're starting to see it really take effect in the portfolio and how we think about future proofing everything in which we're investing today. Thank you, Marcella. Well, <clears throat> I guess we're 
you know, technically responsible for trying to disrupt um, the industry. And I would say that it really depends on how you define technology. I like to think about it more expansively in, in thinking about a change of mindset. For us, it's about moving the industry to a more resident first mentality and showing everyone in the value chain that we can all make more money if we really focus on the resident. And taking some concepts that have really been um, applied in the consumer world, for example, um, long-term value. How can you keep your residents for longer? How can you actually start to change the dial so that people are renting for longer because it's just too good to leave? And as people in their life uh, change and their priorities change, they're growing a family, they're, um, <clears throat> they get a new job, they want to um, trade up, how can you keep them in your portfolio? So we really think about our residents as a network of uh, people who are voting with their dollar and want to have a new standard for what their home is in a city. And that standard takes into consideration not just the individual in an apartment, but what is the building community? How is the building supporting local commerce? How is the building taking accountability for waste and actually truly recycling and composting, not saying that they are doing those things? So using consumer power and really focusing on the consumer, I think, is the greatest innovation that this industry um, is about to embrace. Fantastic. Shana, what do you think? So it's, it's funny coming from a company that is so driven by tech that when I go to any sort of conference or have conversations, they want to know what is the technology that's changing? What's the new thing? What's the new app? What's the new um, integration? And a lot of what we've done in the last four years is actually walk that back and say that innovation comes in the physical environment and that technology in, is changing and disrupting tons of markets, but how does that actually change the physical spaces that we live in? How does that change the buildings that we build? How does that change the streets that we build? How does that actually enable us to have more efficient cities, more efficient buildings? And how do we build the physical spaces that respond to those technology changes? So for example, how do we think about the curb outside of a building? It's totally overused right now, in particular as you think about more and more ride share, in particular as you think about more and more deliveries and last mile delivery like we talked about this morning. How do we think about pricing that curb? How do we think about managing that curb? How do we think about how that curb needs to be dynamic moving forward because in fact it will be robots that will be delivering it the next time, not just cars and not just bikes and people. And so there's so many elements of the physical environment that we live in that need to change because of technology and also be future proof because of technology that we have, have, have really sought to change mindset on it's not just about the digital technology, it's all about how that digital integrates in with the physical. Really interesting point. Angie? Yeah, and I think building on what Shana said, as much as technology is changing our physical environment and our, our neighborhood planning and the techniques around that, the things that aren't changing are really the community engagement strategies and the, the local politics and the smart planning that has to go into any kind of neighborhood planning and development. And that's really fundamentally some of the parts of, of my job at a neighborhood level that, that haven't changed the hard work of really engaging with the community helping them understand the technology and the data that's um, driving development decisions and bringing them on board and getting support for local projects. Thank you. I, I think an interesting point to underscore um, with all our panelists is you need to separate out adoption of technology for technology's sake. So just sort of engaging with a bunch of software platforms to say you're doing it and then a full open embrace of innovation and the new innovation economy. And a lot of the processes that we all do as real estate professionals can really be sped up, <laughs> fixed, changed, uh, improved through a rethinking of our analog processes rather than defaulting to just adopting the next technology platform that comes along. Sometimes innovation and technology go together, and sometimes they're actually separated out. And I think what you're hearing is that the real estate business is just starting to come to terms with that and to embrace it. And one uh, thing that Marcella said um, that we talk about a lot at Metaprop is the old way of referring to your tenants. These were, these were tenants. They only called you when something was horribly wrong. Uh, you never picked up the phone. Um, oftentimes, you didn't even have an answering machine when they did call. Now, they are referred to as your customers. 
Um, you are thinking about customer lifetime value, which is not something ever discussed uh, previously in the, in, the, in the real estate industry, and you genuinely care, um, or at least you're pretending to genuinely <laughs> care, um, because it's good for your bottom line and it's good for your, for your NOI. So I think that, that, that shift to uh, calling these folks customers is, is, is really important, and how do we serve them, not just today, but how do we serve them um, over the next 10, 20, 30 years and in, in, in perpetuity? Um, so dialing in more to the technology itself, Lucy, you have a huge platform, 150 billion Canadian dollars. You must have every technology uh, CEO with this widget, this gizmo pitching you. So how do you engage um, with the emerging prop tech ecosystem, uh, which last time we counted was over 7,000 7, companies globally? That's a tough one. I mean, I think um, we, it, the inbounds are huge, to your point. I think um, we are, we're, we're a three-year-old company, so um, I don't know how much you know about, about Quadril, but effectively the, the organization was set up only three years ago, and I think innovation is actually one of our core values. And just to kind of echo Kathleen's comments previously, you know, when we think about um, how we utilize the, um, the innovative solutions out there and the technology that exists, whether it's a Hello Alfred for our residential portfolio or other such tools, we really have to take a step back and think about process. And I think that's one of the challenges you know, that any organization has is you're inundated from all angles by you know, these products and investment opportunities, but really taking a step back and thinking through our strategy. Where do we want to go? Where are we today and where do we want to get to? Um, our CEO is extremely dynamic and very tech focused, so we, we are not only investing in some of these um, solutions that are out there where we think they may differentiate within our existing portfolio in Canada and potentially elsewhere in our global portfolio. Um, so we have made some prop tech investments for that, uh, for that purpose. Um, and you know we're starting to see the benefits of that within our, our portfolio and, and adoption. But, you know, I think that the general firm belief we have is, is, you know, we were talking about this beforehand, is whilst we want to be leading edge, we don't want to be bleeding edge. And some of these technology tools, the 7,000 that are out there, you know, it's hard to know which ones are going to be successful, which ones may not, may not survive, because not all of them will, uh, and not all, all of them will have the funding. Um, and then, you know, as I, uh, in addition to that, I think um, the other piece of it is on the investment side. So, you know, we're also investing in physical tech-enabled real estate. Um, we made a large commitment this year at, uh, to a, uh, a data center program in the US. Um, so we have a better understanding of what it is that hyperscalers are actually focused on and how their business model is working. Because as we think about our industry and the disruption that the cloud is bringing as well and the opportunity that that sort of presents in, in the industry, we want to be at the forefront of that too. So we're sort of tackling it. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but we're tackling it from a number of different angles there. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, Marcella, you must integrate with some other technology platforms. You just made a, a technology acquisition. Um, maybe walk us through how, how, how you uh, embrace other companies uh, in the space. Sure. Uh, to do that, I would have to walk back to day zero, which is why did we start this company? My co-founder and I were in New York City. We had great jobs in the best city in the world. Um, and we were coming home to dirty, cold apartments. Our dry cleaner was closed when we got off of work. We were eating out of plastic containers. Our quality of life was very, very poor. So Alfred is our attempt at really solving it from the resident angle and earning the trust of the resident to build a lifestyle, to bring groceries into the fridge, dry cleaning in the closet, packages on your counter and 300 other services which can be amenitized and be a service layer across your entire portfolio. So we really started with the consumer building this as a direct to consumer business and over the last three years we've worked with the largest real estate developers in the world who are both operators, owner operators, fully vertically integrated, all different types who think about their buildings in very different ways. They have different theses for how long they want to hold their buildings, turn their buildings. The secret, though, on the macro side is most people make their money from buying and selling buildings. So our job is to show that we not only significantly change the NOI, but that over the long, long term, an Alfred building is going to perform 10 times better. 10 times. Not two, not three, 10 times better. Because real estate, the formula isn't broken. 
We just have a better formula that's around putting consumers first and really starting to think, hey, look, our building is a new center of commerce. How can we start to think about our business in a different way and start to generate new revenue streams that are sustainable? It's not about um, kind of jumping onto the 7,000 new ideas. So as Alfred has evolved, we've become much more of a platform. Our platform side of the business uh, grew at 500% last year, and we work with buildings now um, in a cost-free way. So if you want to plug into Alfred, what we're doing is letting the residents decide which services, which pieces of hardware make sense for them. And that, that is part of that network effect that's really important to a technology company, which is every time uh, you get a customer on your platform, they add value to the entire network. So there's a certain level of intelligence where I can work with a developer and say, what is your goal for this building? Let's figure out a way to get this asset to perform on a whole new level. Thank you. Shana? So uh, if you're going to go back to day zero, I'm going to go back to day zero, too. So when we started uh, at Google, at Sidewalk Labs coming out of Google, um, one of the luxuries of being a part of a Google company is we had some patient capital. And so we went through what we called at the time a thought exercise of reimagining what urban life could be like if you integrated technology in. And um, you know, we took a page from our, our founder and it went back to first principles and said anything. Unintended? <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything is possible. Anything is possible. And in doing so, we, you know, we imagined what this kind of future-looking city, again, the digital and the physical, could look like across all systems. So this kind of systemic, um, expansive view across mobility, sustainability, um, our built environment, the energy systems, the vertical uh, building systems, the social infrastructure, the community development. Um, and then with that vision, that's when we paused and said, okay, you know, what is the goal here? And we said, we actually articulated what are the quality of life metrics that we want to change? Do we want to be uh, net climate positive? Do we want to be the healthiest community that exists in the world? Um, do we want to achieve affordability targets? Do we want to achieve more uh, community building and less social isolation? And I think that what was important in doing that is the point that you made before, Zach, is that it's not tech for tech's sake. And so when when you articulate what are the problems that you are trying to solve, it becomes a lot more clear which technologies are going to solve for those problems. And for us, it's all about quality of life. So it's a similar type of narrative that you're saying, which is not about, about the customer, but how are we improving quality of life for the people who live in the communities that we're imagining building. And you guys have the purview and the capital to take big bets and kind of push the industry in the right direction. And to that end, though, our next guiding principle was, Let's not build anything that already exists out in the market. And so something that's been great over the last five years, seven years, as we've been looking at all these companies and they've been popping up, is if there's a great company out there that is solving for a problem that we articulate, it's not tech for tech's sake, then we go out and we work with them. We either procure them or we invest in them to come and help achieve the vision that we have in the cities that, that we want to influence or build in. Um, and then there's a few cases where uh, if the market is not doing it or we don't think that there's someone that is doing it well enough, then we actually build those products ourselves. Um, but it's been interesting as we've thought about our project up in Toronto, um, we've identified over a thousand different technologies and companies that we think would thrive in this community and that we would need to be able to achieve the goals that we have. And only five or six of them are technologies that we've built at Sidewalk Labs and or at Google, um, which has been a big learning curve and frankly still is with the public because people look at us and they think, oh, you're going to build a Google-fied city. And the reality is that no, there's a lot out there right now, and as long as you are using that to the end of solving for a goal, um, that there's there is good benefit in, in propping up that prop tech ecosystem. Excellent. Pun Thank intended. You. Yeah, two puns <laughs> in one. It's incredible, incredible panelists we have today. <laughs> um, so I think one theme that 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 I heard running through uh, this discussion is that there there are multiple ways to engage with prop tech, to engage with the innovation ecosystem. You can build, you can buy, you can partner, you can invest, you can become a customer, um, you can do a joint venture, uh, you can do all of these things. Uh, I think what's important um, and what we talk to our uh, investors and partners about is that you have to be willing to take risks, willing to fail, willing to experiment to figure out what cocktail is best for your particular organization. Um, so let's shift gears a little. Uh, we'll zoom out a little bit 
and, and then I'm gonna zoom back into some specific technologies, but um, I'm curious to understand, we've heard a lot of discussion about cities, um, about the built environment within cities. How important are cities for fostering innovation? Um, and what is the best mix of real estate uses? Is it mixed use, is it single use, is it multifamily, is it office? Um, what is the best way to create physical environments that foster innovation and technology creation? We'll start with uh, Angie on this one. Sure. Um, this morning, um, Steve from MIT, he had a great line where he said, innovation needs to happen in a place. Um, and I think we're seeing that with the evolution of innovation districts. I, um, there's some great research out there from the Global Institute on Innovation Districts. I think they estimate there are about 100 merging, emerging districts around the world. In the United States, there are about 20 that have reached sort of a level of sophistication. And by sophistication, they mean they're acting as economic engines for their cities or for their metropolitan regions. They're um, centers for research commercialization. And they're catalysts for mixed use, transit-oriented development. So at the University of Chicago and in Hyde Park, we're really learning from those great examples that are out there of innov innovation districts and particularly um, university anchored or research anchored uh, and institutional anchored innovation districts. Um, so we're building upon, as I mentioned earlier, a decade of work in investing in, on our, in 53rd Street and Hyde Park where the university is located to really create a vibrant mixed use um, district that in, includes hotels, that includes retail, that re, and retail that ranges from our national tenants to our small business and our, our sort of aspirational tenants. And we're building on that and really starting to build out our uh, innovation ecosystem. And that's really built around our Polsky Center, um, which is also intentionally located on 53rd Street in sort of the heart of our commercial district to have um, an intellectual anchor, if you will, for this district. Our Polsky Center really accelerates the path um, uh, to market for great ideas. And it, we operate out of our Polsky Center, a 34,000 square foot co-working space. We have a fabrication lab for prototyping of new products. Um, a top, we have a lot of programmatic elements to it, a top ranked um, sort of business accelerator and innovation fund to really promote and expand innovation, not just by the university, by our faculty and students, but it's also open to the community, has a very strong community engagement component. Um, I think we offer more than 400 programs a year, and I think upwards of 20% of our members in the Polsky Center are from the community, which we're, we're very, very proud of. So we're building on that, and our next phase is really gonna be we, we're focused on both place, which I've talked about, and then now we're really um, turning our focus to space. And um, we're partnering with um, Wexford Science and Innovation, and next year we'll break ground on an innovation center that includes about 200,000 square feet of wet lab space and about 80,000 square feet of office space. Um, our goal is to really provide the space for companies, entrepreneurs at every stage in the life cycle. Really in Chicago, making sure that we can retain the intellectual capital coming out of universities, coming out of, um, coming out of our Polsky Center, out of the community, and really provide space from everything from a lab bench, a single lab bench, and a short-term rental to entire lab suites to really promote that uh, innovation. Um, we want to also make sure those spaces include um, great collaboration space to support programming, to support um, uh, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary kind of research. So that's sort of some of the things we're working on around innovation districts. Very exciting. Shana? So um, well, I'm going to switch it a little bit because we also think mixed use is critically important. And as we've thought about and envisioned our uh, plan up in Toronto, it is hyper mixed use, as we call it. Uh, but it's also flex use that I think mm -hmm. is really important because, um, you know, Zach, when you asked the question, you said, what is the right mix of uses in a city? And I think that that changes. And I think that changes over years. I think it changes over months. I think sometimes it changes over hours. And so we have done a lot of work around how do we think about having much more flexible use of space. So if you think about it at the, you know, the biggest, grandest scale and over time, that's 
flexing our post-industrial spaces in our cities into new uses, which you're seeing in basically every city yeah. around the world. Um, and that's a lot of the inbounds that, frankly, we get at Sidewalk Labs is all these post-industrial uses. That's what it is up in Toronto. How do we think about the new use for this space? Um, that's where you're seeing growth. When you think about it on a smaller level, at the building level, we have done a lot around designing buildings so that they can be flexed. Um, based on what the need is for that building. So over time, you think about how do you build parking garages, for example, that can be flexed into other uses once we need less room for parking. I mean, this is not something that's happening in the future. This is happening today. Like, in the Millennium Garage down the street from here, there's too much space because there are fewer people that are parking in Chicago. Now, that's always been a problem in that garage, but nonetheless, it's a worse problem today than it was before. And then we also think about it at the actual building level that you might be able to change over months or years. So we've built in um, flexible panels that look, no offense to Four Seasons, a little bit nicer than this flexible panel, um, but that allows you to break down the, the walls 50% faster and at 50% less cost. So that includes rethinking the walls so that they are not panels in of themselves with insulation and with wiring in the middle, but using, for example, DC power that allows you to not have to rewire everything Thing and be much more flexible about your use within the building. Um, and then the last thing is just changing at a very moment to moment, hour by hour level. We just invested in a company called Ori, um, which is robotic furniture. And so when you think about people living in smaller spaces, they need to use that space more efficiently. And so they need to change the use of that space over time. It's like, it's frankly like a new version of, and a robotic version of a Murphy bed. Um, but it has also more uses than that. It has the desk, it has you know the closet that comes down from the ceiling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it allows you to change the use of your space, your living space in this case, um, for the needs that you might have for tonight versus tomorrow morning. And so I think that in addition to mixed use, which is really important, I think we also need to be thinking about how are we building for flexible uses in our cities and in our buildings and in our rooms, frankly. And just, I just think one extra point to add to that. So we talked about this a little bit earlier. I think the physical infrastructure and the physical built environment of our cities that exist today. If you look at downtown Chicago, for example, you know, 24-7, about 50% of the day in a 24-hour period, those buildings are vacant. Mm -hmm. Those office buildings are vacant. So what can, I, I think, Shani, you made a really good point. Like, how can you think about those in a more flexible and flexible way? Even office lobbies, I think we're starting to see landlords like us in our buildings in Toronto, for example, we've started to create alternative uses make them safe environments. I think security is something that really shouldn't be underestimated, um, but also enable them to be used by people in cities who, you know, frankly, space is now uh, as a commodity and it's, it's at a premium. We all know all that the challenges that exist there. The other thing I wanted to just touch on again, which I think you touched on briefly, Shana, is the flow of goods in and out of cities has changed. I think fundamentally, if you look at Detroit, for example, today, that was a city that was built for cars. Mm -hmm. The reality is we're, we're moving to autonomous cars. We're moving to very probably, you know, Shana, you, you're a very strong believer in this, I know, to drones and robotics. So how does that change the way our cities evolve over the next few years and, and how we think about the footprint of our own existing portfolio, which clearly, you know, is, has been the same way for many, many years and worked just fine. And, you know, everyone that's invested in office globally has, has managed just fine until really the last five years where we started to see disruption. Marcella? Well, if we go back to like just the city point, um, I, I studied urban planning and as part of my curriculum, you pack a suitcase and you live in cities for three to six months at a time. So I spent time in Argentina, in China, in India, and in comparing all of these different cities who were experiencing different rates of change, you start to get an idea of what good could look like and also what really bad could look like. <laughs> and, but 80% of the world lives in cities today, and 80% of Americans are going to live in cities by 2030. I know that stat sounds crazy. It, it's a true stat. And what we're seeing is that second-tier cities are growing at a much faster rate and that the residents who live there want the same lifestyle as the major cities on the coasts and have the discretionary, you know, they're voting with their dollars and they want uh, new. And so in these kind of second tier cities, we're able to build things ground up 
which gives developers the opportunity to rethink and really start to drive more to mixed use and, and to deploy all these different technologies. But at the same time, we have to retrofit all of our current cities in New York, here in Chicago, um, Detroit. What do you do when you're, the city is so spread out? How can you actually start to take advantage of what a city can offer, which is density? the density of your customer base, the density to be able to try new things and learn very, very quickly. And we have to harness what the, the best of a city can offer, which is culture, um, its interaction, its um, change, while mitigating the worst, pollutions, lack of security. Uh, and if we can take the mentality of trying to solve things at a city level, that's really where I think the power centers in our country are right now. We just heard a bunch of people talk about things at a national scale, but it's really cities right now that are really changing um, how things are happening and, and have the voice. And if you look at somewhere like, like LA or New York, they are setting global policy. Like Mike Bloomberg, he made it a, a, def, a, a status quo thing that you don't smoke inside built space. Or he, he started 10 years before most of the cities in the United States to think about how can a city be green and how can we start to rethink our waste systems. So I think cities are the most important economic unit of our time. Um, excellent points across the board. So we're seeing, we're seeing innovation maybe starting in, in, in our first uh, tier cities, in our primary markets, definitely happening in our secondary markets. Uh, one of the panels I set on Earlier today, people were talking about secondary markets as uh, places that were ripe for real estate investment, especially those secondary markets that have infrastructure set up around education, around good government principles and policies, around uh, healthcare, um, transportation infrastructure as well. Um, so very, very important points. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg. Um, Many of us have uh, varying degrees of experience in public service uh, on this committee and in this room. How does government innovate uh, on a level akin to what we're seeing in the private sector? How can government change the way they do business while still preserving law and order um, in order to help with things like driving down the cost of, of housing and other things that are necessary to ensure the long-term uh, viability uh, of our, our cities and suburbs uh, in the future. Um, we'll start again with Angie. Go sure. down the line there. Sure. Um, so in an era of very limited resources, it's really important to think about policies that government can promote that reduce development costs, increase building and construction efficiency, and really promote equitable development in our neighborhood. So I think Chicago, I'll give a couple of examples in Chicago that I think are really good and, and have, have, um, we've done a really good job here. Um, one of which, uh, our former planning commissioner, David Reifman, who's in the room, was, was his policy, the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, which really allowed developers, uh, downtown developers, to increase de density by paying into a fund that could then be deployed into neighborhoods on the south and west side of Chicago, and those into commercial corridors, also into incubators, um, tech incubators, uh, business incubators, really things that help promote innovation in the neighborhood. So that's a great example of a, of a policy there to promote equitable development. Um, I think some of the transit-oriented development policies um, it, that have been advanced in Chicago over the last few years are really good in terms of figuring out ways to decrease parking, uh, you know, uh, uh, development located near transit, also being expanded on development lo located on high efficiency bus lines to reduce parking, um, really to reduce those costs when it comes to development. And then I think finally, um, the city monumentally uh, updated its building code, um, it, which hadn't been updated in like 70 years. And, and uh, now can, we can incorporate in the development community um, more efficient materials, more efficient construction technologies, and that sort of thing. So I think those are the kinds of policies that are, are going to be helping drive equitable and innovative development in the city. Thank you. Shana, what do you think? So um, I think I forgot to tell the part how about prior to Sidewalk Labs, I worked in uh, Mayor Emanuel's office on economic development, where I did everything that former Commissioner Reifman told me to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I, you know, I would build off of some of those examples, but also connect it back to what Marcelo was saying before about how you're starting to see cities at the very local level and leaders in cities take control of, of policy, of regulation, of planning, 
And, you know, partly because you get some of these superstar mayors, one of which I worked for, but also because they're ha they have to. Yeah. They have pressures that they have to. And, and I would say that they are pushing a lot of those pressures, frankly, down to developers. Um, and so I think what you see is um, as climate change is more upon us, and we're not seeing any change at the federal level from that, and you see Bloomberg and other mayors leading on that, as we see affordability becoming more and more of an issue, in particular in, in big cities, but then also in hyper-local areas of some cities, like in Chicago you see it, affordability in some issues in some neighborhoods and total disinvestment in other neighborhoods. Um, as you see from that inequity, um, both in our economy as well as in neighborhoods, so it's very physically obvious when you start to see in equity. Um, as you see a lack of investment in infrastructure coming from the federal government, typically where we got money from before, as well as a lack of investment in affordable housing, all these things are compounding. And plus, by the way, most state and local governments don't have any money to do anything with it because they have massive liabilities, um, one of which we are very familiar with here in Chicago. And so what happens is, you know, the, the local governments are um, both taking it under their control, but also there's only so many things they can do. And so what you're seeing I think is a lot of that being pushed out onto the private sector and onto developers. And so what you see developers then having to respond to is more affordability requirements, um, having to deliver on infrastructure in a way they never had to before, meeting uh, various sustainability regulations that didn't exist before. And the, the effect, I think we're just at the beginning, some of those trends have been coming for a while, but I think we're at the beginning over the last few years of all those beginning to converge. Um, you know, and the worry of the effect of that is that there's going to be a chill and that you're going to have less investment and in particular some of these massively growing big cities. And you know, in one case, maybe that's good. It right sizes to the secondary markets. Um, but in other cases, that just feels wrong. What, to actually solve these problems, you need to keep investing in the cities. And by the way, you're never going to fund your pension liabilities in the there's continued investment in the cities. So you have this vicious cycle that could happen. And so, you know, what can government do about that? Well, first of all, government, fine, if you're gonna push it out, but then you have to be willing and to be innovative on the response and the solutions to solving for that. So for example, in affordable housing, um, you know, the, the solutions to date have been mostly around subsidies. And the reality is that subsidies just only go so far. Um, you know, I work for Google that just committed a billion dollars, billion dollars to affordable housing and the reality is it's all in subsidies and the reality is that that's not actually going to nearly solve the problem that exists despite that massive number and despite the fact that Google can frankly afford to do that. Most companies cannot. And so the, the government needs to be okay with us thinking more innovatively about how we solve for that problem. Is it the construction market and bringing to market at a much lower cost? Is it thinking about um, how we think about space differently and different co-living models, how we think about amenities differently and shared amenities, how we think about the right public infrastructure that's around it? Is it about how we think about innovative financing models? I think maybe that's the other panel and they can, they can solve that one. <laughs> But you know, here in Chicago, we've been doing TIFF over and above and beyond most other cities. But there's lots of different ways you can start thinking about innovative financing models. But unless the government is going to be willing to play that game um, and, and frankly pilot new regulation, whether that's zoning regulation, affordability requirements, et cetera, we're never going to be able to solve those problems. Thank you. All right, I'm going to shift gears uh, just for a minute and uh, talk about a buzzy uh, topic in our industry, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, Elon Musk has said that with AI we are unleashing the demon. Uh, different thinkers have, have uh, other thoughts about AI. Um, just show of hands in the audience, who here thinks their job will be replaced by an artificially intelligent robot in 10 years? <laughs> Excellent. So you're all going to keep your jobs except my partner Aaron Block. So. The, there, in, in, in real estate, Lucy, there's this elusive goal of having uh, artificially intelligent, sentient robotic being underwriting uh, deals for us. So is that AI or is it BS? <laughs> so, so the funny thing is, I don't know if you were listening to Len's panel, Len's panel this morning. He actually specifically talked about the, uh, the predictive analytic AI tool that they have uh, they've developed at USAA, which I was very interested to hear a little bit about. Um, so, you know, I think just taking a step back, I think a lot of us, myself included, are still trying to understand what AI 
is as it relates to our industry and the impact that it's going to have. So, and what the definition of that is. So, you know, I think all of us know it can help us, you know, drive efficiencies, recognize patterns that perhaps at a pace that the human brain just can't, um, can't do, frankly. Um, so, you know, the theory is it can make, help us make better decisions, communicate better. Um, so for me, whether it's underwriting or actually portfolio management, which is really where my interest lies, um, you know, I think there is an opportunity for us to utilize it. Um, and it's something we collectively are certainly studying in, in greater detail and, and leveraging the relationships of these inbounds that we're getting to understand better. And I think automating a lot of that process um, just to give you a context, my team, we have 350 physical real assets uh, outside of Canada um, with a number of operating partners across the globe. And every quarter, I get my team get all of the financial reporting that comes in and all the data that, that is all in PDF. It's completely unusable. Um, and you know, respectfully to our partners, they do a great job of providing the data. I have a team of four that have to analyze that data, and then I have to roll it up. So. For me, this would be an absolutely phenomenal tool to uh, enable us to look to deficiencies in the data, uh, to also help automate and quicken the process of me being able to turn around my team's valuations, and then the reporting to our client BCI ultimately. I think it also, um, you know, definitely there is a role, and I think to the point you made about replacement of people's jobs with you know, robotics or automation, Back and front, back and middle office. For sure, there is opportunity there, and I think that's where we'll probably see the biggest impact in our industry, um, and risk mitigation. And I think that was where Len was going with the research component of it. But certainly, as it relates to the operating portfolio or our investments, I think that's where there's real opportunity too. Um, and you know, I would love to to continue to develop our knowledge of the the application of AI within our business. So for that to that end, to answer your question, I don't think it's BS. Um, I would like to think that there is a lot of opportunity there for us to grow. I'm just not sure that our industry is yet caught up with the potential that AI offers. Great. Marcella, how, did, how does uh, Hello Alfred approach uh, artificial intelligence? Well, Zach, since you sent out the questions a little bit ago, we did a little bit of work for you. So <laughs> <laughs> we work with uh, 133 developers today, including um, the largest in the world in multifamily. And we asked them how they were using AI or thinking about using AI. And we got two that said, mm. we're using it to return the phone calls and leads from every person that comes to our website. So mm. forget about lead score. I don't, if you guys aren't, uh, that's basically being able to see where someone, um, what they've engaged with on your website and should help your brokers decide who to reach out to. They're saying, get rid of lead score, let's just robo call everybody. So that's the current status according to a residential. Hmm. But I, I, I don't think that real estate is going to break glass on AI. I think it's going to be something that happens across all of our industries. And I think as consumers, we need to be thinking and paying attention to where we start to see it pop up and then say, how will that affect our business? But in the meantime, I think the most disruptive thing in our industry is just data yeah. and data transparency like asking 133 developers how they're using AI. <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree. I think the data question is the biggest challenge we have. And the problem is data is the, the, the availability of data is just so huge today. And Kathleen's example earlier was pretty uh, insightful as to how their data scientists and the fact that actually Blackstone even has their own team of data scientists, I think, should be, should be commended. Because I think that's, frankly, where our industry is headed. But, the question then is the data scientists become robots, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well that bell that just went off in my head signals that it's time for the lightning round. This is unscripted. I would be remiss if I didn't, has every, anybody read the news today? Or looked at Twitter? Anybody? So some news, I'm not talking about um, whistleblowers, I'm talking about news about uh, uh, WeWork. So, in my industry, in the technology industry, um, we used to, uh, there's a term SaaS, software as a service. We work coined the term space as a service. It is now devolving into scandal as a service. Mm. So dun, dun, dun. given that, what company, let's, whatever happens with WeWork right now, 
I think we can assume, based on your comments earlier, the idea of flexibility of space is certainly here to stay. So what company, individual, or entity is, could step in to fill that void? Is it going to be innovative real estate firms like CBRE with their HANA product? Is it going to be other folks who we heard from today like Convene? Is it going to be Hello Alfred? Who is going to fill uh, a potential void from WeWork? We're going to go down the horn. Let's start with Lucy. <laughs> I knew, I knew you'd pick me first. Um, <laughs> I don't think any one person is going to fill the void from WeWork. I mean, there's 3,000 other, um, in the UK there's alone, there's 3,000 other flexible office providers. So, you know, there's lots of groups out there um, that are, are, are kind of disrupting, I would say. And I think Steve put a great chart up earlier on, a slide up where he showed all the different groups in that space really focusing on the need of the customer. And I think that's something that Marcella touched on, and I, I really appreciate the comment that, and, and Zach, you picked up on it as well. So I, I'm not sure that I'm going to answer your question, because I, I feel that um, there are so many, there is a lot of great companies out there. Um, you know, we like, and we're investing in some of those groups, and we'll see how that evolves. Um, but I think the, the, the customer has to be the focus. Um, and you know it's unfortunate what's what's transpired with uh, we will or we won't. Uh, I don't even know if they're we anymore because if he's leaving, who knows? But you know ultimately, um, I think they they were kind of um, you know at, at the forefront of this change, and that they, they should be commended for that. Um, but ultimately, you know others have have jumped on that bandwagon, and I think are, are disrupting what WeWork's model is as well. Thank you. Marcella? I didn't answer yeah. your question. <laughs> That's quite all right. I, I think that last point around um, being the innovator as a founder, I, I really appreciate people who build categories that didn't exist before. And since we have people who you used to be uh, leaders at Uber and at WeWork on our team, for them, I would say they were part of making an industry change. But there's also a reason they no longer work at those companies. And I think that there are opportunities to take the idea and then to execute it better. If you think about we, where WeWork was going, they were trying to do what most people in this room do well, which is think about built space differently um, and use design and brand to attract consumers into that space. I think that the industry actually is in a good place to innovate there themselves. And in residential, you're seeing a much faster reaction um, to this idea of short-term uh, or kind of co-living concepts, so sh short-term stays and co-living, we're seeing most of our um, developer partners start to get into that themselves. My point being that the barriers to entry on this are very low. Yeah. And if you think about where WeWork was trying to go and where their multiple was really pointing to was the idea of it being a network that the members would cross-pollinate and be selling and interacting in a way that WeWork would benefit. And I would posit that's really where we started. We sell services, we create services, we create jobs. And our network is our business. And it's always been around having the voice of the customer, having the voice of the resident. And through that, setting a new industry standard. So I'm putting my hat in the ring. All right, thank you, Marcella. <laughs> Shana? Um, so one thing that we talk a lot about at Sidewalk Labs is integrating the urbanist and the technologist. Um, and so half of our company is our engineers, product managers, former Googlers. I don't think we have anybody formerly from WeWork or Uber. Maybe we should look for some. Um, not from my team. And then, not from your team, <laughs> of course not. Um, and then the other half are from the urbanist side. So developers, uh, planners, former city officials, et cetera, et cetera. But putting those together is what we believe is going to be the secret sauce that's going to start to disrupt cities, urban environments, and the built environment. And so I don't know who's going to fill it, but I do believe that whoever does fill it, first of all, I don't think they're actually going away, but whoever does fill the void is going to be the type of company that can be humble enough to understand that you have to integrate the learnings from the last X number of years with executives and people who know a lot in this industry with the outside in disruption. I mean, even, I don't know a ton about your background, but even the fact that you went to urban planning school, which by the way, I want to do that program where I get to go to all these 
in the cities, um, but then you have you are now in a technology company. Right. I think that bringing multiple disciplines together and having the humility to be able to understand the value that comes from each is the one are the ones that are not going to get out ahead of their skis um, and too big for their britches and will succeed. Great point. I'm guessing here. I don't. I don't think there's one company that's going to step in. I think it's a multiple companies. I feel like Zach, though, that you want to answer this lightning I, round I, question. I, I so don't. I, I, I have another. I'm pushing us you. forward. I have another <laughs> lightning round question. I have two that I want to get through, and then we want to open it up. So we are in right. Chicago right now, and the most famous rapper from Chicago is a gentleman named Kanye West. And so we're going to play a game. It's called Who Said It, Kanye West or Adam Newman. <laughs> so I'll start with quote number one. I'm going to be one of the biggest real estate developers of all time. What Howard Hughes was to aircrafts and what Henry Ford was to cars. Just the relationships I have with architects, my understanding of space and sacred proportions, just this new vibe, this new energy. <laughs> That's all right, Angie, is that Adam Newman or Kanye West? Kanye. Okay, Shayna. Adam or Kanye? Kanye. I Mar hope. Marcella? Well, that last word, energy, spiritual stuff, that's Adam. Okay, Lucy? I'm going Kanye. But Kanye it is Sunday Kanye service. West. Right. Yes. You're right. Messing. Final quote. The 90s and early 2000s were the I decade. The iPhone, the iPod, everything was about me. Look where that got us in a terrible recession. Angie? Adam Newman or Kanye West? Adam. Okay. Adam. 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 Correct on that one. That was Adam Newman. All right, before we open it up, there are a handful of buzzwords we throw around um, between AI, blockchain, drones, and robots. Which of those four are most likely to disrupt our industry in the next 10 years? Anybody can take it. Just one word. We don't have a time combinatorial for of all of them together. All of them together. Yeah. So a blockchain-based robot <laughs> that flies around. All right. Flies yep. around the room. Okay. Yeah. And that, Shana said that, not Kanye that. or Adam. Uh, well, with, we got to end with that. That's a very strong end, I think. Um, so let's open it up. We have uh, uh, some time for. Uh, I got more questions, but we got. We want to open it up. Yes. Um, well, when we underwrite, we're underwriting for companies that are going to grow, that are going to grow quickly, that are going to eventually grow into profitability, um, but we don't need them to grow into profitability uh, for us to make money because of how early uh, we tend to invest. Um, I would say there, there wasn't discussion of shareholder value on this panel, but there was discussion of... Uh, NOI accretion, yeah. which sort of drops down if you're uh, a, a public company, a public REIT, that certainly would drop down to a concept of shareholder value. Um, so for us, you know, we, we want to invest in businesses that are double bottom line businesses if we can. Uh, we like businesses that are using technological innovation to solve big hairy problems like housing affordability. Um, but we are not a, we are a for-profit organization and it is our uh, fiduciary duty to drive returns and multiples on invested capital for our limited partners. So um, we are investing, what I would say fortunately is there are some really big hairy problems in real estate that impact uh, a lot of people, a lot of everyday people and have the opportunity if they're fixed or changed or altered or augmented or improved have the opportunity to create shareholder value, but also to better people's lives, better their customer experience, better their living experience, whatever that may be. So I don't think anyone on this panel um, 
so other than Angie, everybody on this panel works for a for-profit organization um, and is definitely driven by whatever their, their metric is. It might be, it might be slightly different um, for Shana and Marcel and Lucy um, or me, uh, but, it, but it, is, it is important when we are diligencing a company, I would say we, one of the major questions we ask is can this company drive NOI accretion to our limited partners, friends, and their customers? And if the answer is no, we most likely will not invest. But I think just, I would echo exactly what you said as we think about those 7,000 companies that maybe tap into us. You know, we do think, we have a fiduciary duty to the pensioners of British Columbia. So whatever we do has to make sense and, and be accretive to their return. And so to your point, I think everyone, every deal or investment that we make is with them in mind. So whilst we probably didn't talk about it outwardly here today, I think whether it's conceptually with NOI or even looking at future obsolescence of buildings in our existing portfolio uh, and making sure that we're future-proofing them for 5G, for example, something we didn't talk about today either, but I think is something that all of us think about um, as the evolution of, of technology and all the data um, that's going to be required to support that going forward. So. Um, yeah, I would 100% echo what, what Zach said. Yeah, and the 5G debate, we, didn't, we don't have time to talk about it, but there, is, uh, there are two sort of warring factions at this point, and no one really knows what's going to happen. Some people believe that 5G is going to turn all our properties into Faraday cages, and there'll be no more connectivity whatsoever. And then there are some people on the complete other side who think that 5G is going to enable this new revolution in smart home technology, yeah. smart office technology, um, and everything's going to work seamlessly. Um, so we are uh, constantly trying to talk to experts about it. And what we've learned, the more people we talk to, the more we learn that no one is an expert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you are an expert, please come see me. I'd love to chat with you about it. Any more uh, questions? Yes, please let, uh, let us know who you are, where you work, before you ask. Daniel Reddick, First Washington Realty. Picking up on your last lightning round question, um, the deposit of FIP technology, autonomous vehicles, mm -hmm. mm. that the panelists think that, how that will impact their businesses or the biggest problems in the world. Maybe Shana's. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we talk about it nonstop. If, if it's not the main driver, pun intended, it's one of the main drivers of how we think cities are going to change and real estate will change. Um, and what is interesting about thinking about this on a macro and a neighborhood district level is you can start to actually think about those impacts and the systemic impacts they'll have. Um, so I, I think at the beginning of the panel, I talked about a very simple example of how you even think about the curb. Um, but when you think about having autonomous as vehicles, uh, you know, will people actually even park their car ever, or will they have it just drive around all day while they're in the office? And if that's the case, what does that do for congestion? And if that's the case, what does your curb look like? Um, and so we we think that it is absolutely one of the biggest disruptors, um, and that if we aren't thinking about what we do about that and how it has impact on our physical environment, we are not future proofing. So um, garage spots, garages, and parking spaces, another good example. Um, you know. Know, and to bring it back to the, the first question, we are absolutely for profit. Sometimes people get confused and think we aren't, but we are, um, you know, per the shareholders of Alphabet, we are absolutely for profit. And when you think about those something like autonomous vehicles and we start to think about mobility totally differently, um, what is the next version of a TOD? What's the next version of a transit-oriented development in an autonomous world? Um, and how quickly can we get to a place where we can actually justify that a product that we offer mobility as a service means that people living or using that building don't need parking spots in the, anymore just like if they're right next to transit and therefore how does that then drop exactly to the bottom line of that real estate development how does that allow us to meet the affordability requirements that you're putting on us that we need um, to actually build in that space and so um, we think that it is critically important to how we think about cities and down to the building and how people experience them all right, I think we have time for one last question. Yes. This might not be a short answer, but um, Susan Swansea of Photos Wild. So the question has to do with, and a couple of you may be better positioned to answer than others, but how important is it when you're evaluating um, strategic investors in your different prop tech initiatives or that are, you're thinking about investing in, do the strategic investors, how important is it to you that they control the real estate as opposed to being a, you know, a third party manager, et cetera. Do you think about that? 
Uh, we think about it all the time. Uh, we, we have limited partners that span the whole spectrum, um, as Marcelo was mentioning, from fully vertically integrated owner, operator, developers who also self-perform, um, all the way to outsource third-party managers. And what's important for us when we invest in startups is to understand different people's incentives and what might drive them to adopt one of our portfolio companies' technologies. So some of the companies in our portfolio are, for a variety of reasons, better suited to go and pitch uh, a third-party property manager, um, and then some are better positioned to uh, help a vertically integrated owner-operator. Um, so what we try to do uh, is diversify our LP base to have all of those groups represented, um, and then also diversify our portfolio uh, to ensure that one, we're making good investments and de-risking, but also that we're able to uh, create customer um, relationships with uh, the, the, the wide variety of different types of LPs we have. 